My name is Frank Amadeo. I am a federal felon and a federal prisoner, and I am actually innocent of the crime for which I am being punished. Eleven years ago, I was convicted at a hearing where I was not given constitutionally guaranteed unconflicted counsel, while the state of Florida declared me incompetent, and while I was improperly medicated by the government. That all arises from an event that started in 2005. A publicly traded company in Detroit, Michigan, Presidian Corporation, contacted me to assist them with a problem with their Florida subsidiaries. Ultimately, I found a solution to that problem with the assistance of uh, a dozen or so accountants and attorneys and two or three law firms. That solution was implemented, but the way the fee structure had became, I got paid in cash and the consultants took shares in this publicly traded company and formed Miraculous Ventures, Inc. Six months later, we learned that Presidian had much deeper problems than were originally solved. Then, Miraculous would go along and buy out the main subsidiary of Presidian, which was a, a publicly traded, with the, the publicly traded company was a professional employer organization, a staffing company. During 2006, Mirabilis' subsidiary, AEM Inc., acquired and managed the Presidian Solutions subsidiary and didn't pay $100 million in taxes. In 2008, I was indicted for that crime while I was at a mental health hospital in Harvard. I appeared at a hearing with an attorney who, if I didn't plead guilty, was stood to lose millions of dollars in fees. I end up in prison with a prison unable to medicate me and leaving me essentially in a stupor for about two and a half years. But the, the period of time in which I had a chance to originally bring these issues to the court. And because of that, I'm still a federal prisoner today for this crime that I don't even believe occurred and I certainly did not commit. That's a long, complicated story on first hearing, but let's start with some details. What specifically are you charged with? Failing to make sure that a corporation paid its payroll taxes in a timely manner. <laughs> That's the crime. I, I, was, I didn't make sure that this company paid its taxes. Was anybody else charged in association with these alleged crimes? No. Five or so corporations were indicted and they pled no contest and that was it. Just me. Was there any penalty for them? Uh, the, the only penalty they really experienced was being having the taxes, the taxes that they didn't pay due, nothing more. Um, we looked into the ownership of Mirabilis and we found that you are not listed as a director at any point. Uh, what was your role with Mirabilis? Well, that's why I would go all the way back to the beginning. I, I, when I did this original consulting with Presidian, Nobody else wanted to do it. They didn't like the guys at Presidian, so they refused to participate, and I took the case myself. When I needed them, because it was a publicly traded company and it had all these complexities, they came in and formed Mirabilis to hold Presidian shares, and I left some of the cash that was part of the fee in there so that, Presidian, so that Mirabilis would have money to get started and begin this, this new plan and this new company. So I, I lent it money. You were essentially... Uh... An investor? It was a credit. It was a credit. I wasn't even an investor. I was, I was not supposed to own any of that company because they had a plan that was separate from mine, and I didn't. So uh, I lent it. I lent it five million dollars, is what it amounts to, out of the fees that came in in Presidium, and I was an advisor to them throughout their their history. Did you control the corporate financial accounts of no, Mirabilis? No, I had no signature authority and no actual authority on on the Mirabilis accounts. At any point during all this, from start to finish, did you have any belief that you were uh, committing a financial or tax crime? No. Um, you mentioned you relied on a, a, a number of accountants and, and, um, and attorneys. Uh, what did they tell you? Universally, we were told that this conduct was legitimate because the taxes, the, the non-payment was fully disclosed to the IRS 
and that senior creditors who had liens on the assets took priority over the IRS payments. Who were all these people? Uh, the Presidian Corporation general counsel was James Byers. He, they, their advisor was Costalonic and Feech, which is a law firm out of New York. And UHY was their auditing firm out of Chicago. Uh, on my side, that was on the Presidian side, there, my attorney was Berman Keenan Regera, and Richard Berman there, you, and Hans Byer at Buchanan and Ingersoll. The accounting firm was Racklin, Cohen, and Holtz. The principal was, Rack, was Lori Holtz himself. And Jose Marrero, who had just retired as deputy commissioner of the IRS in charge of criminal investigations. Those were the accountants there. There's about 120 professionals throughout the, the companies, but those are the primary ones that were giving advice early. It's a lot of different professionals giving a lot of advice and nobody indicated anything you were doing was even a bit shady. To, to the contrary, the undercover tapes that I assisted in acquiring and the security camera tapes show that they were affirmatively advising individuals that this was legitimate conduct. Could you explain the concept of mens re? M mens re is the part of a crime that deals with the way a person thinks. So for, for a manslaughter while driving, the mens re is less because the very fact that you're drinking shows that you're putting people at risk. For regulatory crimes, tax crimes in particular, mens re, you have to know your conduct is, is, is prohibited by law and that you're breaking it. So it's subjective intent, specific intent. Those are the, a higher standard of mens re. And there's lesser standards of mens re based on common human experience. You know it's wrong to hit your sister, so there is no requirement that you know that it's against the law that you hit your sister. It's just that you know you're hitting your sister. Mens re is your mind. It's the way you think about something. What kind of evidence do you have that you did not willfully violate the law? Uh, to, to begin with, I have statements from attorneys and that there were eyewitnesses to the events. I have audits and reports done by the accounting firms that proved the conduct and said that it was legitimate, a tax memorandum that at least implicitly states that the conduct was legal. I took four polygraph exams and passed them all to support all of those allegations. We have 87 hours of undercover tape that are uniformly consistent that with the fact that any intent was negated by the professional advice and the IRS constantly being aware of this and allowing it to happen. And then, you know, the final event is some of the companies that were uh, in, in acquired are security companies. So all the rooms were recorded. And we have 27,000 hours of video with about 300 and some hours actually addressing this issue. In none of those circumstances did I or anybody else look guilty. We talked about it as if it was a normal event and that's because everybody thought it was. The bottom line is to commit a tax-related crime, you have to know it's a crime. And you did not, so therefore you're factually innocent. Is that? That is correct. That's it in a nutshell. In a nutshell, it's simple. Uh, in one of the, the best examples is there were a couple of attorneys who were, who testify at court that I only learned of the duty of the corporation to pay the taxes in 2007, but all the conduct occurred in 2006. So I only knew of the legal, the, the potential illegality after the conduct had ended. There's no way I could have committed the crime. And this was your defense team and advisor? It was my defense team and advisor. He, he told the court the facts, but didn't bring forth the legal conclusion. The chairman of Mirabilis was also one of the accountants that provided advice. His, the president of Mirabilis was uh, the former head of Coopers and Library in Europe. They were the signers on the bank accounts. They had underneath them several other CPAs that signed on the accounts. I never signed on any of the bank accounts. I didn't sign the tax returns until the, 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 the only tax return I would ever sign would be during the midst of the investigation the government wouldn't take the tax returns unless somebody signed it. Everybody else had left. I said, bring it to me. I'll verify that the information that was given to you already is accurate. And if it is, I'll say it. So I didn't sign the tax returns. I didn't sign the bank accounts. And I had no legal authority in the company whatsoever. And you, you believe that you'd work out a payment 
plan with the IRS. No, I don't. I don't think that's a, that's not an accurate well, statement. I, I that's okay. Let, the, the, yeah. the point is, the, the IRS. We, there's 192 communications between the IRS from 2005 to the time in which the investigation commenced in, two, in at the end of 2006. These were, I mean, they're on a personal level such that the IRS officer is talking to the, the accountant about where they're going to go for the weekend on vacation and what their kids are doing, all along disclosing to the government, here's the amount of taxes that were increasing. The plan was to pay off everything else but the IRS and then sell the now cleaned up company so that it would pay the IRS back. That plan the IRS knew about because I spoke with the IRS's general counsel about that regularly during the summer of 2006 about because they couldn't take the stock as payment. They said, we're not allowed to own stock. And I'm like, well, then we have a problem, but why don't we create a trust? And you'll see these communications back between John Lordy, the IRS, and myself trying to figure out a way that the government could actually own the publicly traded stock and they can sell it off to pay back the tax debt. So that was the deal with the IRS. It wasn't so much a payment plan as it was a plan to have them paid back, but they understood the process we were going in to get them to the point where they could get paid. And you believe that that was uh, a, the IRS was uh, agreeable? Shoot, not only did I think it was agreeable, I thought it was a great strategy. I did a whole big town hall session with the videotape so we could market it. And partially marketed because the IRS knew about it and the former head of the criminal investigation division was one of our advisors. I mean, not former from like, 10 years ago, he just retired the year before this case started, and he thought it was okay. And, and in the meantime, you were concerned, you were taking care of your employees. Oh, the, there is, yes, one of, the, one of the notions that was early on in the event was whether anybody could be harmed, and we checked and the law requires the, the, the government gives credit to the employees automatically, there was no danger to them whatsoever, not for one minute. They would all get credit for whatever was whatever taxes they were due. And you also wanted to make sure uh, they had their health care. One of the things with the companies that was important is that if you chose to pay the taxes in some cases and didn't pay your health insurance, then the companies would lose their ability to keep the health insurance policy. The employees would now have a termination event and there was no pre-existing condition rules at the time. So it was partially making sure that all 27,000 employees didn't lose health insurance along the way. Anything else you want to say about uh, this topic? The, you know, the, 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 if, if this, if, if this had been done in, in the dark, if it had been done under a veil by myself or the others, then, you know, I would expect something. But you have reports where IRS CID came and visited me about one of the companies, that, not our company, but a company that was under investigation. And I talked about it then. You have me talking to the Department of Labor about the $70 million deficiency. Right? And you have just dozens and dozens of videos of professionals who would never risk their careers saying, hey, we got our IRS points together. This, this, And going through this whole long, we're ready for the IRS, none of which anybody paid any attention to. That, that's the, the killer part. That nobody, they, they, it seems to me, and I have enough experience now to understand a little bit of the dynamics why, that they they wanted a conviction and developed a storyboard and the, the shocking part about it was I had all these recordings and then nobody would watch them. Let's talk about conflict of interest. Can you explain in the most basic way why your legal counsel uh, had a conflict of interest and should not have represented you at all? He was a witness to um, the criminal events alleged criminal events. He had been threatened by the government that if I didn't plead guilty, he was going to lose what would be about $1.1 in cash, he and his colleagues, and lose a $26 million contingency fee contract. At what point did he uh, witness these alleged crimes? When, when, when the events occurred, one of, one of the events of which I'm convicted for was uh, obstructing an administrative agency investigation. Uh, first of all, we there was no investigation at the time, but my defense counsel was in the front row. And when I later got uh, convicted, it was for that event, which he was present at, and he could have been a witness that testified to the nature of that proceeding. But, and if he's a witness, he can't be my attorney. 
What would have happened if he had ex, uh, revealed that he had a conflict of interest to you? Well, the government was the one that told me there was a conflict, and they did it just before sentencing. Had that been raised originally, they would have removed him as counsel and there would have been a substitute. He also might have had to disgorge a few hundred thousand dollars in legal fees so that I could get another private counsel, but he would no longer have been attor the attorney for sure. You mentioned that the, the financial, uh, uh, substantial financial uh, a payment at risk, what else would have been at risk for your counsel? Well, in addition to that, some of the money came from what the government claimed were the unpaid taxes, specifically from the AEM, the, professor, the company that didn't pay the taxes, to the attorneys. And they could have been indicted, they could have lost their legal license or been sanctioned if it had known that they had taken proceeds as personal fees that they knew or should have known to be criminal months and there was a deadline for for your attorney to, to either have you uh, make a deal or lose the money they, they were told that if I didn't sign a plea agreement without any changes within three days then they were going to take the fees away from them and this even though both the government and them had known from separate attorneys who were witnesses that the the sta statement of facts was blatantly false. Um, at, at what point did you realize that the, the witness advocate conflict existed? At the, they filed it the Friday before sentencing started the next week. When uh, my attorney is at, for sentencing called me over and told me that the government had just filed this motion. And then at the beginning of sentencing, the court had little hearing to discuss it with, with the attorneys. What should have happened at that point? The judge asked if the government insisted that I waive the conflict to go forward, and I refused. And the judge said, well, I'm going to let you do whatever you want, and we're going to go forward anyway. He should have stopped the hearing, appointed separate counsel to advise me on the conflict. And, and I know the court was aware of it because it asked the attorney, hey, could you advise Mr. Amadeo about the conflict? And the attorney, the, the attorney, Mr. Sands, said, no, I can't judge because I have a conflict advising Mr. Amadeo about the conflict. At that point, I asked the judge if I could get somebody new, and he just let the hearing go forward. So there were a couple of conflicts. One, the attorney was a witness, and, and two, your attorney stood to lose a large amount of money. The, the, the attorney stood to lose a large, large amount of money if I didn't enter a guilty. What was your state of mind when all this was going on, when you were encouraged to enter this guilty plea? Uh, I have been taking a um, antipsychotic medication. I wasn't at the time of the plea, such that by the time of sentencing, they ordered me to stop it because it had reached toxic levels and they were afraid I was going to die. Literally, they broke into my condominium to tell me to stop taking the medicine because I could die at any time. And so, you know, looking back on it now, it, I, I was, it's a zombie-like feeling, and it wasn't, it was more than that at the time. And people just tell me it's a combination of the stress and the overdoses that were the problem. But this was all prescribed and court-ordered. I didn't have any choice but to take that medication. And why was it prescribed and court-ordered? Because I had been declared incompetent by the state of Florida, sent to a mental health institute, mental health hospital in, in uh, affiliated with Harvard and Massachusetts. And when they came back, they had a prescription of drugs, which I was supposed to wean off of over time. But the courts didn't understand that, and they just ordered me to take it, or I would have to be put in custody. Despite being declared incompetent and being on this toxic level of medication, they put a piece of paper in front of you and said, plead guilty. And your guilty. attorney said that. The attorney told me to, to, to plead guilty. It wouldn't be more than two to five years, and uh, I did. <laughs> so it turns out that it was, uh, I got maxed out at 270, 270 months. So yes, they knew that. What they did is they hid from the federal court that I'd been declared incompetent. They didn't have my guardian present, even though a guardian had been appointed. Once you're off this medication, uh, after a few years in prison, looking back on this, what do you feel? Oh, it's, you know, it, 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 I tr truly feel these guys took this, they didn't plan this medication to make me incapable. It happened, and they took advantage of this opportunity. They saw me falling asleep, they saw me drooling, 
they understood that I was not nearly as capable when I was medicated, especially improperly. And I think they left me on it so that they could, they knew I wouldn't be able to respond. They honestly believed, and the system is set that way, that by the time I got off the medication, it would be too late. The only hope I would have of getting out of prison early would be to uh, agree to remember things so that other people could come to jail and my sentence would be reduced. And they asked me to do that, and I had refused. When you just said you were falling asleep and drooling, that was in court. In what it was in the state court, I fell asleep. I, I fell asleep and, and was drooling. In the federal court, it would be more often that I was just nodding off, and they would have to prod me to wake me up. Do you want to add anything else to this? I, I think that more than just me, the, the the prison system is not meant to take care of the mentally ill, and there are a lot of people in there who are mentally ill that need help. And I was very fortunate. Very fortunate that the doctors there were willing to take a chance on me, let me get off the medication, and develop an alternative means to control the disease. And, and that part, that's part of why I have this extensive, that, that training, what saved me in prison, is the fact that I was a good lawyer and I had all these clients that I was willing to work for for free. So then I would work 16 hours a day, 365 days a year, for nine years to make sure that other people didn't have to experience the hopelessness that I felt. I'm Frank Amadeo. I have been diagnosed by multiple public and private institutions, including McLean Hospital at Harvard, as a rapid cycling bipolar one disorder. As having a rapid cycling bipolar one disorder with psychotic features and chronic delusions. How does living with this brand of bipolar disorder affect your life? It, it is, um, you know, I, you, you look back over history and I have these high points and low points and, and I can see now that when I'm on this run in, in the manic zone, I'm ex I can do exceptional things and then it crashes. And that's why life went like this all the way through. Now that I understand it, I realize that I get depressed and elated every hour. Every hour I reach, or every couple of hours at the very least, I reach the level of suicide or the type of elation that causes people to think they can fly and jump off buildings. But until I recognized it was a disease and understood it, it caused me to behave in ways that I look back on and say, ah, how could I do that? So, um, uh, What are some it, ways you've helped manage it? Well, the, the, one of the things is you, ha you have to you note as the cycle moves from one to another, you dip, so you, you get, like trigger yourself before you hit the, the before you hit an uncontrolled move. For me, I, I do that by making sure my environment is stable. In prison, what I did is I practice law all the time, morning and night, every day. This way, the prison life has boundaries, but it's not really structured. One day, everybody's got to go to the library. The next day, everybody's got to go out to the recreation yard. So it's hard to plan a day at prison, other than you're going to eat at this time, you're going to stand up at this time. So what I did by practicing law the way I did with so many clients is it didn't matter if I was at the library or the rec yard, I'm writing the next pleading, interviewing the next client, explaining what the law is to people. And so it kind of it enveloped my life in something that allowed me a measure of control no matter what the outside events were. And the other thing I began to accept, it was okay to nap. For me, sleeping kind of resets myself. So if I'm getting really depressed or manic, I go to sleep for 15 or so minutes and I come back better. And, and the, the, the prison paralegals that would do the work for me, they would say, you look at Frank's writing and it literally changes mid-sentence, mid-word. And they would often come up to me and say, go to bed. <laughs> so I'd head off and go to sleep for 15 or 20 <laughs> minutes. We called them true leak maps. That's what they called them. Because in, in prison, you can get an email. But once you get off, you got to wait 15 minutes to get back on. And so they always knew that I would, they could go send me there and they'd go on the email and when, by the time they got done, I'd wake back up and be back to normal or within the normal range. So you, you learn to recognize it. You learn to accept that it's a disease. People think this mental illness makes you stupid. It doesn't, <laughs> well, hardly in my case, and many others. In fact, the, the, most of the reports say that the bipolar guys who are, tend to be manic are very creative. But you've got to understand you have a disease. And that's something that's really hard to do. And I came from a Ital Ital middle-class Italian-Irish background. Mental disease was something you hid away in the corner. And so it took till I was 40 till I knew I had it. 
And the killer with this disease is when you're manic, you don't believe you're sick. If, I'm, if I were manic today and didn't have those little cues that tell me, ooh, your thoughts are racing, you have to stop, I would not believe I was sick and you like being manic. Manic is a great feeling. I, you, I've never seen an illegal drug in my life. But I used to tell the guys in prison, that, hey, your meth and cocaine have nothing over me. <laughs> so. Looking back, do you recognize episodes of hypermania in your teen years or growing up? Yes, I actually recognize there's a, there's a one is I recognize a really bad depressive event. I was in bed during college for like three weeks. I just thought it was a bad cold. And I tell everybody to leave me alone. I stayed there in bed. I woke up feeling good one morning. I said, okay, today I'm gonna get married and go to law school. A few weeks later, I was married on my way to law school. It, just a spontaneous decision. And that's what Mannings would do. I had a really nice house in downtown Orlando. I saw a house going up for auction one day. I went over and spent a million dollars and bought it. For absolutely no reason. I had 7,000 square feet for a family of four and I bought a 6,000 square foot house across the street just because that's what Mannix do. Um, moving forward to your professional career, regarding Morabolus, did your mental illness affect your business making decisions? Uh, yes. I mean, certainly I can't, I can say that the mental illness affected my business making decisions. With Morabolus, I tried to build by then I, I learned that I was bipolar without really completely understanding it and I tried to build in a system that insulated it. In fact, one of the, the Marabolous directors was a psychiatrist, an MD, specifically there to watch me and make sure I didn't do anything that harmed everybody else. I mean, you'll see them on the, on the video saying, our job is to protect Frank from himself. So they were supposed to insulate those decisions, but what it does seem to have done is I seem to have gotten periodically spiked manic. And when you're spiked manic, your perception of reality is different. You don't understand risk. You don't evaluate things. And, and you tend to, um, to blend events and statements into your belief system so that you, know, you will like say, oh, I, I went to lunch here today because it was meant to be that I had steak as opposed to chicken. And whether that's a rational position or not, but as a manic, you never notice the difference. You can't tell. Walk me through some of the events that led up to your diagnosis. Uh, the, so let me ask, the original diagnosis occurred when I was in federal prison they, before. They, they were the ones that diagnosed me. Right, the original. The diagnosis. original. Here, here, here's what takes place. I don't believe I'm sick at all. I don't I believe all this stuff is kind of like nonsense. And I go to a boot camp where, um, be, because of my role in the boot camp, the PA said they weren't going to prescribe me Sudafed for allergies anymore. It turns out that was the first time I learned that taking 16 Sudafed a day for 10 years was a problem. I go through that experience and then I end up at the, the end of that, that short term put me at softly field where uh, my wife broke through the Puritan bureaucracy and talked to the prison psychiatrist, Dr. Janet Lewis, and she just got through to me. She got through to say, stop, you don't have to be embarrassed, you're sick and you have to do something about it. And, and I did while I was there. I spent six months and I really thought I had a grasp on it. Again, the, the problem with bipolars is if you, you really got to believe in do, do it all the time because otherwise you'll end up getting sick again and you won't recognize that you're sick. So did you have difficulty accepting your diagnosis? Not then. I was pretty good at, at that, but I came out and thought I was cured. You know, a couple, three years, no problem. The probation office went out of their way to make, they, they changed the court order so that I would have a government paid therapist to watch me through the supervised release period and make sure that I was uh, always had somebody to warn me if it looked like I was cycling. And that was, that was the, what the therapist viewed her position as, is to not do diagnose or treatment, but to be available to say, ooh, you have to stop. Go home, go to sleep, don't do anything this weekend. And if, in, in, in those cases, let the probation know if they thought there was a problem so they could come over and help enforce the fact that stay where you are. After, after that ended, there was a short period of time I just couldn't afford treatment anymore. It was, it was coming all supervised release, and the treatment is relatively expensive. And so once I got out of it, I never went back. But I did get the, the psychiatrist to be on the board of directors, and he told me I was fine all through this process. It never came up again until they, till the, the, during the investigation. 
My defense counsel said, you need to have treatment because you want to go to the court and show that you know, you're taking care of it. And they, I went and the doctors said that um, he believed I was delusional and gave me medication to break the delusions and kept upping the dose until it was like a thousand milligrams of Seroquel a day. So supposedly, that's the experimental peak that they're allowed to according to the PDR. And um, I started falling asleep and drooling. And How did you handle the news that you were being investigated? Did that affect any mania pattern? Um, in, in retrospect, yes. But at the time, I didn't think so. But when I go back and watch the tapes, I can see me being depressed at periods of time and anxious. And it's the anxiety that caused my family to support the medication treatment, thinking that it was, this was an abnormal anxiety. Because through most part of the investigation, I wasn't really worried we didn't do anything wrong. I'm like, literally the first day, I said, look, go over there and tell them. I'll come in and tell the whole story. Or they can send people over and sit right next to us because and let the chips fall where they may if we did something wrong if i did something wrong i'm just going to admit it i don't play these games you know i don't lie under oath i never even thought about it i believe in god it's important to me so um but they but i can see now that the when you when i simply watch the videos of me and having if i didn't see them i wouldn't have believed it was affecting me but as you watch you can see them different in them today i would have noticed those cues way before they got to the, the conditions they were so the investigation was stressful, but then, then the drugs just wiped you out. I was gone. During the indictment process, did your lawyer or the judge take your mental illness into account? Uh, they, they, they didn't, yes, but they did it in a very, a very interesting way, a deceptive way. And that is nobody told the federal court that I had been evaluated and found to have been so incapacitated they appointed a plenary guardian. They kept that from the court. They also didn't tell the court that I couldn't get treatment. I did once, and the judge asked some questions, and they kind of walked around it so that they defined that I wasn't getting treatment for the medication uh, that was supposed to be prescribed. And so I was taking the very prescription that nearly killed, would nearly kill me. And that, but if they told the court, the court would have done something different, so they had to keep it quiet. And again, I don't know that then, just as, you know, it's just about everybody I've ever met goes into that criminal system, even some of the criminal defense attorneys that end up in prison, and they're shocked by the way the federal system works. I didn't understand what was happening was wrong until it was too late. In 2008, um, Harvard Medical and McLean Hospital confirmed that you were incapable of managing your own affairs, including the right to vote, marry, drive a car. So were you fit to sign a plea agreement? No, absolutely not. What was your what was your mental state like while you were signing it? Can we, you recall at all? Um, yes, I mean the, the 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 reality of the of the, the medication at the time is that I tended to follow. I, I would avoid conflict to an extreme degree, and because the attorneys had really pressed upon me that I needed to do this, in fact, I came back and, and, and refused to sign an agreement because they said Armadale knows what he did wrong. I'm like, that's a lie, I won't sign it. And I didn't. Even the plea agreement that's there doesn't reflect that event. They created this deliberate indifference concept to get me, to get me around it. And so it was depression. I mean, I, I felt foreclosed to have any options. I'd had some other individuals who were, you know, advisors to me who uh, suddenly had gone silent. They were silent in the process. I now know that they had been threatened. But I didn't know at the time that they were threatened. It was just it was a, so the depression had set in. And I just kind of went along with everything, but I refused to admit that I knew anything was wrong. I just did not do that right up until now. I've never changed. It's not in the plea agreement. It's not in the factual proffer. I made them take it out. But other than that, I just kind of went along because it was a fait accompli. Did that depression continue into your first couple years? Oh yeah, the, the depression was magnified when I first got to prison because they kept me on all the medication. I got a tray of medication that they call, in prison, if you don't take your medication, you get punished. They put you in the special housing unit, you get denied all your privileges, you can't go to visits. So one day I get called over the speaker, the whole PA system of the prison to come there because I hadn't been taking the medication. They had a tray of medication. I'm looking at this like, I'm not going to take that. I said, this is 
physically painful. I am in excruciating pain when I take these drugs. By that time, I had gained, I began to gain a little, you know, credibility at the prison because I didn't cause any trouble. And even in the, the infancy stage, I was able to help other inmates with legal stuff and was willing to do so. So the doctors got me together and they said, look, right. We understand you don't want to take this medication. And truthfully, we don't want to give it to you because it's too expensive anyway. But we can't give you the cognitive therapy that was prescribed for you. We don't have that capacity. So we'll let you stop the medication in stages. And if you do good at each stage, then eventually you'll be, able to be allowed to be disallowed. It took two and a half years for me to get off the medication. And then I have a psychotic experience. Sure, so within a two years after that, because I, I didn't grasp the way that changes in the environment, sudden surprise changes in the environment caused all this reaction in me that, that, that are difficult to deal with. And so I learned that I have to, it was, it was going to be sick forever, that this disease does not go away. I also learned I'm never going to let them medicate me again, and, and I would find this, this method to solve it. But it, it, it took a long time, and it was more than just depression. It was you feel physical pain to get you when I was draw, withdrawing from these drugs. Now, being released from prison is obviously a huge change in environment. How have you been doing since your release? Uh, you know, for some people, it was surprising to tell them that, number one, that I was tricked out of the prison. I, I, I helped write the rules for this home care, the new home confinement stuff. And one of the things that they have me doing, I specifically was not going to. Had I known, it would have been a different event. Because it is really hard for a bipolar to get used to, for me at least, to get used to this. I don't want to say anybody else. But for me, this environment, these sudden changes, was, was tougher than being in prison. It's been harder than being in prison. So it's how are you managing your health on the outside? Uh, I am, um, I, one of the things I've been able to do here is I've been able to change a diet and that actually made a difference. I didn't necessarily believe that, but I now know for sure it is. The prison diets of sugar and starch are killers, and they actually do affect the bipolar cycles. They make them more extreme. I also simply develop, you know, and I'm able to exercise here in ways that you can't in prison. That's not really fair. Most people could go exercise, but, but the bipolar cycles didn't let me go out at the, the right times and in the right places. The only thing I could do in prison was do the work all day long. And then I work all day long. I haven't changed that much. But it is different that, you know, the kinds of restrictions and rules we have here are different than those in prisons in many ways, other than the fact that you're confined within this area. Being in prison, you're freer than you are in society. So in there, most people don't care what you do or how you behave. The prison culture is live and let live. As long as you don't do the break the prison rules, and as long as you don't break these codes that exist among inmates. So, and those I, I felt too naturally. I was okay with that. I got used to it over a decade. Here, I'm getting used to it now after six months. Okay, how has your mindset evolved um, around your diagnosis since 2000? You know, it's interesting. I actually think everybody should be bipolar. <laughs> because when I'm hypomanic, and now that I can maintain that state for extended periods of time, I think so much faster and so much clearer than, than, than I do otherwise and that I see other people do. But it's evolved because I'm not embarrassed about it anymore. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not something that you should be humiliated about. It's something you, ha you are. No more than, you know, if you had lost a limb or if you had some form of cancer, it's a disease. You can manage it, you can control it, and you can make really good use of it. And so in that case, it's, it's, it's a good disease to have as long as, you, as long as you're willing to manage it. And that takes paying attention to it, being conscientious, and not being afraid to talk about it.